Let's face it, weather is the most variable and complex element of the wildfire environment. Wait, the wildfire environment? Yeah, you know, the place where you work, the outdoors. We can't control the weather, but we can improve our understanding of it. Do you know how to get the weather information you need? Fire weather forecasts are a key part of assessing the environment around you. But do you know the differences between the types of fire weather forecasts? Do you know what each forecast variable even is? This video will help you understand, interpret, and use the weather information provided in these forecasts. We will introduce you to the information found in all fire weather forecasts, show you the most important pieces, and finish by describing the similarities and differences between the three primary fire weather forecasts. All fire weather forecasts contain four sections, the header, mandatory variables, optional variables, and an outlook or an extended forecast. So let's start with the header. This section provides three pieces of information. At the top of the header, you'll find general information about the forecast. This includes the type of forecast, the National Weather Service office or forecaster that issued it, the date and time it was issued and for when it is valid, and the area that the forecast is valid for. You need to make sure that your forecast is valid for the time and the place where are you working. I mean, it's like that sack lunch and you have in the back seat of your truck. If it's out of date, you probably don't want to eat it. Next you'll find the headlines. The headlines will include any fire weather watches or red flag warnings that may be in effect for the area. Headlines are the shiny objects of the forecast. Look at them first as they likely convey the most important weather concerns for that period. But because headlines are relatively rare, most forecasts will not have them. And finally there is the discussion. The discussion tells the story of the forecast and how the forecast variables are likely to evolve with time. The discussion may include information on when an inversion might break, if a front will pass through, when thunderstorms may begin to form, or how much rain you will get, or if there are any other caveats pertinent to the forecast. The discussion should put the forecast itself into context. Now on to the mandatory variables. Every fire weather forecast includes four mandatory forecast variables. Why are they mandatory? Well, it's because they're the most important and the easiest to measure. They are sky weather, temperature, relative humidity, and wind. We'll provide a brief overview of these for now, but for more information regarding the other content in this video, you should check out the NWCG Guide to Fire Weather Forecasts, PMS 425. The sky weather section describes the expected sky condition and the probability of precipitation, or POP. Sky condition is the expected cloud coverage. Think partly cloudy or mostly clear. Sunshine or cloud cover can significantly impact fire behavior by changing fuels conditions. The probability of precipitation is just that, the overall chance for precipitation for your area for your forecast period. For example, a 30% chance of thunderstorms, or an 80% chance of snow. This section will not tell you how much precipitation you can expect. Look for that in the discussion section. The forecast temperature is the dry bulb temperature, which is the highest temperature expected during a day operational period, or the lowest temperature expected for a night operational period. If you are working in complex terrain, you may also see a forecast for ridges and valleys when and where the temperature is dependent on elevation. You may also see a 24-hour change so that you can relate today's conditions to those on the incident yesterday. If it is significantly different, it is a clue that your fire behavior may also be different. The relative humidity, or RH, is expressed as a percent and is, very simply stated, the amount of moisture in the air. Low values of RH can help to dry the fuels, which may then lead to an increase in fire behavior. The forecast for RH will show the minimum expected value for a day operational period and the maximum value for a night operational period. Fine dead fuels, or one hour fuels, are most sensitive to hourly and daily changes in the RH. Like temperature, you may see trend values or values for differing elevations here as well. And then there is the wind. Frankly, the wind is the most difficult variable to predict. I mean, we give one value for wind speed and direction in a forecast, right? 
But is that going to be the only wind speed and direction for the incident you're working on? No, never. It's unreasonable to expect the wind to maintain the same speed and direction over a large area for an entire operational period. Wind funnels and channels around the terrain just like water flows around a rock in a stream. Within the forecast, the wind forecast is either specified as the 20-foot wind or the eye-level wind. Remember that the 20-foot wind is the average wind that is found 20 feet above any vegetation and can be as much as two times higher than the eye-level wind, depending on vegetation and terrain. Wind speed is given in miles per hour and wind direction is reported as the direction from which it is blowing. For example, a southeast wind is blowing from the southeast to the northwest. The wind is often the most difficult variable to forecast, mainly because it is unreasonable to expect the wind to maintain the same speed and direction over a large geographical area for an entire operational period. Yeah. The wind is likely the most important factor in determining fire spread direction and spread rates, and changes throughout the day, so it is imperative that you know the timing of any potential wind shifts. More information on wind shifts can be found in your forecast discussion. The remaining fire weather forecast variables are called optional variables because they may not be included in the forecast. These variables commonly change from region to region across the United States depending on local needs. Common optional variables include chance of wetting rain, or CWR, mixing height, inversion, transport wind, smoke dispersal, Haynes index, and lightning activity level, or LAL. These optional variables add supplemental information to the forecast information to ensure that you have the most accurate information at your fingertips. In most areas, the CWR, or chance of wetting rain, is the chance of getting at least one-tenth of an inch of rain during the forecast period. This amount typically wets fuels enough to prevent new ignitions, reduce spotting, and slow rates of spread. Unfortunately, though, a low CWR value combined with a high chance of thunderstorms may imply dry thunderstorms and the lightning that accompanies them. And remember, if you are burning in heavy fuels or under a dense canopy, a tenth of an inch of rain probably won't do much to diminish fire activity. And just so you know, a few areas in the U.S. consider a quarter inch to be a wetting rain. Just recognize that you need to know the value for the area that you work in. Inversions represent a layer of air where temperature increases with height. Because of this, an inversion represents very stable air and smoke does not want to rise through an inversion. There are several different types of inversions, including marine, frontal, nocturnal, and subsidence inversions. The most common is the nocturnal inversion and is present most mornings. These form at night when cold air settles on the surface, leaving warmer air above. As the ground warms with increasing sunshine in the morning, the air above the ground warms as well. Eventually, the cold, stable air that formed just above the surface during the night will have completely warmed, and the inversion breaks. In general, this occurs between 1,000 to 1,300 hours. The fire can also modify the timing of when the inversion breaks. A very hot fire can break the inversion sooner, while a dense smoke layer can allow the inversion to linger. Regardless of when the inversion breaks, Air mixes well vertically, and the mixing height can grow substantially in a short time. Now how does this affect fire behavior? Large fire growth can happen quickly after an inversion breaks because surface temperature increases, relative humidity decreases, plus winds may get gusty. Watch your smoke column in the mid to late morning. If it starts to reach much higher heights fast, it is likely that the inversion broke. Mixing height is the height in feet that wildfire smoke will readily reach. The air between the surface and the mixing height is called the mixing layer or well-mixed layer. Days with high mixing heights are typically more unstable and allow the smoke plume or convection column to be transported high vertically. Nights typically have very low mixing heights and if smoke is trapped closer to the surface, you probably have an inversion and hazardous air quality. High mixing heights may be related to conditions when explosive fire growth is possible. 
The transport wind has a good name as it is the wind that transports the smoke. It is the average wind speed and direction through the mixing layer. The transport wind directly impacts the smoke plume and has serious implications for smoke management. The transport wind may also give you an indication of the direction of potential long-range spotting. There are several smoke dispersion metrics, but the most common ones are the ventilation index, or VI, and the atmospheric dispersion index, or ADI. Higher values of each imply better smoke dispersal. Often, a smoke dispersal adjective, like poor, good, or excellent, might be the only thing you see here. An important reminder is that days with excellent smoke dispersion are often days that are very conducive to large fire growth. For more information on smoke dispersion, check out the NWCG Smoke Management Guide for Prescribed Fire, PMS 420-3. Finally, this brings us to the Haynes Index and the Lightning Activity Level, or LAL. You may see both of these products in the fire weather forecast, but I won't elaborate on them here. We're going to be phasing these out in coming seasons. The bottom of each forecast will include an extended forecast or an outlook section that may contain forecasts for fire weather variables for the next one or two operational periods. Use these for broad planning purposes, as it is only helpful to know uh, what to expect down the road. Just remember to use the latest version of the forecast at the start of each operational period. All right, so now you know what is in a fire weather forecast, but there are several different types of fire weather forecasts available that you need to pay attention to. There are three types of narrative fire weather forecasts, the fire weather planning forecast, the spot forecast, and the incident or incident action plan forecast. Let's compare the purpose of each type of forecast. The fire weather planning forecast is the most general forecast and is provided as a decision-making tool for pre-suppression planning. Use it at the start of your shift to improve your situational awareness of your local conditions. Friends, you gotta be aware of your situation. The spot forecast provides specific and actionable weather information to be used for wildland fire and prescribed fire operations. The incident forecast is created specifically for fulfilling those incident or ongoing fire suppression objectives. Where are each of these forecasts produced? Both the fire weather planning and spot forecasts are produced by your local National Weather Service Weather Forecasting Office. The incident forecast is produced by an incident meteorologist or IMET who is generally on site at the incident. And by the way, IMETs are generally pretty awesome folks. Each forecast is designed for a specific geographic area. Fire weather planning forecasts are produced for fire weather zones which are generally county-sized areas of land with similar climate, weather, and terrain characteristics. Both spot and incident forecasts are produced for the area of the incident. So, when should you use each? Read your local fire weather planning forecast at the start of each shift to gain an understanding of your local fire weather situation. Spot fire weather forecasts are very helpful on prescribed fires, hazmat incidents, or emerging wildfires. If you are working on a wildfire prescribed burn, request a spot forecast at the beginning of each operational period or if the weather changes significantly, rendering the current spot invalid. The incident forecast is typically produced for each operational period on the incident and should be used in the same manner as a spot forecast. Both spot and incident forecasts provide actionable information to use in tactical operations. You can also get a spot forecast from an IMET on an incident, but that request goes directly through the IMET and not the NWS. Regardless of forecast type, start a conversation with those around you about the forecast. How is it different than yesterday's forecast? What is the biggest weather issue that you might face today? How are each formatted? Fire weather planning forecasts differ by region or state and are driven by your Geographic Area Coordination Center or state guidelines. Familiarize yourself with the style and format of your local fire weather planning forecasts. For continuity, the format for the spot weather forecast is standardized. Mind-blowing, right? The spot format includes the header and all the mandatory variables, but you can request other forecast variables if necessary. The spot forecast must be requested online through the NWS spot request portal on your screen or through your local dispatch office. The incident forecast includes similar information to a spot forecast, but other variables may be included at the discretion of the IMET or of the incident management team. So how are each communicated to you? 
Fire weather planning forecasts are produced and delivered by the National Weather Service through their web portal and commonly over the radio. Spot forecasts are both requested and received through the National Weather Service spot weather webpage or through the local dispatch office over the radio. The incident forecast is a written product found in your incident action plan or IAP. An IMET can also communicate any differences in weather on large incidents to branches or divisions directly and through briefings. Remember to give feedback for both the spot and the incident forecast or any forecast product that you use, frankly. If the observations don't match the forecast, don't keep it a secret. It's very helpful for the forecaster to know if their product was accurate or if it wasn't worth the paper it was written on. The forecast can be updated with additional field information and providing feedback will get you a better forecast product down the road. Each forecast type has a distinct level of service. The level of service is the amount of dialogue you should be able to have with your forecast. Now, dialogue with a forecast? Yes. Just bear with me for just a second. The fire weather planning forecast is a highly automated procedure resulting in a low level of service. The spot forecast has a higher level of service because the forecasters actually know where your location is and they have knowledge about the terrain and other local considerations. If a critical update is needed, the forecaster will provide a written update followed by a verbal confirmation that you received that update. Finally, the incident forecast has the highest level of service because the IMET is on scene and able to communicate either in person or over the radio. Two-way communication is key when working with an IMET or an NWS forecaster as they will produce a better product when given your fireline observations. The paper forecast is great, but having dialogue with the forecaster behind it gives you a better product. I should mention that there are a few other types of forecasts out there. For example, an IMET can issue a spot forecast to support a burnout operation on a large incident, but the format of those types of forecasts will be similar to those formats that we've already talked about. Hopefully this video explained the fire weather forecasts and the weather variables they contain. But remember that understanding is only the first step. You must be able to apply the information. Forecasts are very valuable, but they are static documents, whereas the fire environment is dynamic and constantly changing. To best understand how the weather will evolve through an operational period, you need to build a mental model to help yourself understand what is causing the changes that you may be seeing in the fire on the ground. It is also important to understand how the weather will change over time so that you can be prepared for any changes. To build on your skills, go to the next video on how to build a mental weather model, which describes a process on how to apply, adapt, and adjust the forecast to better prepare you for your specific situation.